how to be a legendary Silicon Valley CMO, why category design is now the number one skill for chief marketing officers, and how you should pick a CEO to work for. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Legends and Losers. And I uh, want to say, um, uh, hope all of our friends in Canada had a great Canada Day. Canada turned 150 years old on July 1st. And hope that all of our American friends have been having a happy July 4th Independence uh, Week. All right. Our guest today is Jennifer Johnson, and we have a dialogue that really sits at the heart of our mission and um, how to design a legendary business and a legendary life. And in particular, we are absolutely hacking one of the minds of one of the greatest marketing people in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of folks who consider JJ to be um, kind of the most sought after um, technology leader in, uh, in tech. Um, She's the chief marketing officer at security company Tenable. She's a category designer and a Silicon Valley uh, tech uh, startup advisor. And uh, before Tenable, she was the head of marketing for enterprise software company Tanium. And before that, she was a partner at the storied, high-profile um, Sand Hill Road venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. Before that, she was the CMO at Coverity. And before that, JJ and I worked together back at Mercury Interactive. Um, from the minute that uh, we uh, pressed end on, on recording this dialogue, uh, we've been dying to drop this show because of how absolutely incredible Jennifer Johnson is. So uh, I, I really do love this gal. I, I think you will too. So here it is, our dialogue with the legendary Jennifer Johnson. Confident in not just being a CMO, but really category design. Like we should talk about this. CMOs that don't understand how transformative category design is for their own personal career are missing the whole boat here. Like, <laughs> well, why do you say that, JJ? It's true. I mean, I will tell you, like, you know, Tanium probably op like opened the door for me at Tenable in, in terms of building my brand, but Play Bigger. Play bigger sealed it. It really did. And I think it was partially because there was appetite from the entire executive team, the founders, the CEO, like to do category design. I mean, it was one of the skills they were looking for in hiring a CMO. Um, how, and how high, to, sorry to interrupt you, but how yeah. high up on the scale of requirements for CMO was category designer? Number one. It was number one. It was number one. Wow. Uh, the prede my predecessor was very operationally focused, put a lot of really good measurement in, um, was a demand gen guy, right? Which is, you know, it's a very common, right? You need someone at the beginning that has strong positioning chops and then you get some scale and maybe you need someone that's got a little bit more, you know, operational demand gen. And then it kind of is like come out the other end where the company now needs to figure out, okay, well, they were in a category that's, that's, lived its useful life, right? And vulnerability management, how do we actually go now and supersize ourselves, right, as a company? So it's kind of gone full circle back to this notion of the CMO really needs to go help drive this, the, the category, right? And the company strategy. And I'll tell you, like, this has been, like, like, actually doing it and driving it. My role has transcended from being the CMO to being the chief category officer. Really, yeah. right? Yeah. Unbelievable. And it's, it's been fascinating. It's like a psychological experiment, right? It's like when I, when I conduct the workshops with the team, I almost have to like suspend reality for like the next four hours. I am not the CMO. I'm not even a member of the company. Like I am an outsider category designer. Like I can say whatever the hell I want. Like I, there, there's no like, you know, even though I have to go, you know, work with them after the meeting, but like we can suspend like all rules for four hours. It's, it's a pretty cool thing actually. You feel oh, holy <laughs> shit, JJ. So this category design thing's kind of working out for you. Is that what you're saying? It's kind of working out. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I mean, it was great working with the guys for six months, the six months in between Tanium and Tenable, but it's a whole different ball game when you're in there doing it. Like I, what I gained was a much greater appreciation for the art of the process, working with Alan Dave, 
and like all the little nuances that you don't necessarily see when you're sitting in the inside and having that knowledge that really i mean i don't think i could be driving what i'm driving now without having that knowledge and that appreciation but it it like it it's an it's really a cool process like i'm even watching you know the team that that was the part of the team that might have been a little more skeptical the zeds if you will like i had a huge moment two weeks to, last week actually where i converted them like they're in it and now they're like they well, are just 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 watch because if they're true zeds even once they're in they can worm their shitty little asses out <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. All maybe, the these, maybe you have awesome Zed, so I don't want to. Yeah, it's a great team. No, it's really a great team. So I'm, I not to not to spoil our, you know, not to spoil our thunder, but you'll be seeing some interesting things come out from Tenable. In the and and months. so, how would you, how would you design? We'll, we'll get to Tenable for sure. How, how would how would you define? Um, what a category designer is and does. Yeah, that's a good question. So one I would say is they're not, I think the skills of a CMO, it's a natural fit for a category designer, but it's not a marketing exercise, right? And so I think that is really important for people to understand. And I think that's one of the pitfalls. When the CEO goes to the CMO and says, go figure out our category, because that's usually what happens, right? Is that's part of the CMO's charter. And they go off and they figure it out and they come back to the table and you've got the product team that's off building something over here and you've got 10 different opinions right in the room and so what usually happens is if the cmo drives it and they don't have the backing of the whole team and the whole team isn't engaged from the beginning is it's a campaign you get like a it's a it's a great message it's a you know a provocative point of view maybe like and it like lives for a couple quarters, right? And then the next shiny thing like comes along and everybody goes away. So it's, kind of it's, goes it's what we fucking hate. It's messaging. It's, what's like our messaging going to be for the next two quarters? Yeah, it's not branding. <laughs> it's not messaging. All that, And I hate to say this as a CMO, but like I'm not a brand. I'm not a branding CMO. Like I, I get the value of having... A brand oh come on! Can't we spend the next three quarters and uh, you know fifty million dollars debating which hue of blue we should change in our logo? It drives me fucking batshit. Seriously, like I'm a I'm a product marketer at my core. So like, why is it every new CMO that comes in, we got to change the fucking logo, and we got to redo the website? Why? Why? It, why? They got to pee. They got to pee on it. <laughs> what? Why do they have to do that? That's right. Because they like they you can always work. tell, and they there's a company who will remain nameless because I have some friends who work there, but like, fuck, they just dropped a press release about their new brand. And first of all, press release about your new brand. Okay. Maybe. Uh, but when you read this thing, it is full of marketing Brando babble, like, like of the nth degree. It's, it's, it really, JJ, it reads like something out of the fucking office. <laughs> <laughs> totally right like technical jargon i hate that shit like, why don't more cmos know that all that mumbo jumbo is not what their job is you know what i think there's two types of cmos there's ones who are real business executives right and then there's very tactical and this is not a knock on cmos because there's a lot of really smart cmos out there but i think there's very tactical cmos and i think this but there's a very important thing in the industry I think we have to solve for is terminology of titles. So when I was in my recent search for CMO, I talked to a lot of companies and a lot of CEOs and a lot of recruiters. How many, how many, just frame for me, JJ, what, what would a lot be in your, in your last search? Between, between recruiters and VCs and yep. CEOs, the right? It's thing. like a funnel, right? Yep, you go the to the VC, they want you to go talk to like 10 CEOs, then you narrow it down to the couple that you might be interested in. And then you have, of course, it's seeing if there's a, a fit all the way around, right? But what I felt, and so I would say, you know, in that time, I probably talked to, and this was very much me interviewing them to find the right fit, right? Um, and, and, and hold on a sec. Hold, hold on. I hate to interrupt you, but I'm gonna. Yeah. Say what you just said. That it was me interviewing them. Okay, not what do you mean? What do you, what, yeah, so unpack that for me. Okay, so I think that a lot of people can get blinded by a lot of 
shiny objects from looking at roles. But what I was interviewing for, I was interviewing the CEO. I needed to find the CEO that I could, I had trust in that they, A, understood what marketing was, B, appreciated it. Three, we, were, we had a value alignment, right? Philosophically, we were, value, we were aligned from a value perspective. They were someone that I liked as a person. Like, I think we forget about that. We're all people at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, do I trust them, right? Are they, I don't want an asshole. I need someone that I can look in the eye and have them look me in the eye. And we know that when shit gets rough, because it's going to, that we're still going to stay and row in the same direction. And that takes a long time to find that. Per- it's, like, it's like getting married, right? Yes. You go on a lot of dates. You like, there's some people that are great, but they're just not right for you. And when you find the one, you know it. And my CEO now, Amit from Tenable, he is awesome. Like I met him on a Zoom call. It was the first time we spoke. Like literally it was like work love at first sight. I knew the second he opened his mouth, I said, this is the guy. This is the company. I already knew. What's, uh, what's Loverboy's name? <laughs> <laughs> Amit Yaron. Uh, Amit Yaron. Yeah. Yes. Well, of, of course, you know, I know Jack yes. and uh, from Tenable. You don't know Jack. <laughs> I know Jack. <laughs> and I know Jack from Tenable, and that's the Jack you want to know. He's yes. a great guy. I, and, you know, we've never really done anything together, but we've had communication over, over a handful of years and, and a few, on a few different topics, you being one of them, by the way. Um, but... Uh, He's always been a very straight, very honorable guy. And uh, when I spoke to him most recently, you know, the things he had to say about him were, were, were awesome. So uh, I, I'm stoked to hear he's such a fantastic guy. Yep, he is. And I mean, if you and think I, of- And I just, I, I, I still don't want to leave this. What, how did you get to a place in your head, in your life, JJ, where you got that when I'm looking for a job and you're looking for a job and you're not somebody who's independently wealthy, you, you need to go get a job. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but in spite of the fact that you need a paycheck at some point, right. Your, your headset is not what most people who are quote unquote needing a paychecks headset is your headset is, Hey, listen, I'm interviewing you way more than you're interviewing me. Right. We, We could hear the aggression in your voice. I love that. Where did you figure that out? Where does that come from? The, hey, fuck you. I'm interviewing you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question, right? And I could, I could take hours to <laughs> psychoanalyze the response to that. But I would say that, you know, I think to look at anyone, you have to, to understand anyone, you have to understand how they were brought up, right? And, and where their roots came from. And I, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a very industrial, blue collar, gritty town. Um, my dad was Ger- is German and Swedish, and my grandfather. It's still a family business after seventy five years. Started a level, you know, levels those things with the bubbles in them, right? Those, yeah. those hang on the wall, right? Johnson Level and Tool Manufacturing Company. No that, way. Yes. Still, no way. Dad. Still. Still, to this day, it so is So are, are you the heir to the I am, Johnson I am level, the level. I am the level you the, heiress. You're the level heiress. <laughs> to the Johnson throne. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's great. Right. And That's uh, right. hey, Colin. Yeah. Y- you know what they say, eh? What do they say, eh? It's a big Johnson. <laughs> they, they actually, the funny story, they made a tape measure called the Big Johnson and they got sued. By that's the like right. the Big Johnson brand, so that's a funny story. But oh, they, they wanted to call one of the products a Big Johnson. They did. They called their tape measure a Big Johnson. That was uh, we'd like thing. to show you our Big Johnson. That's right. That's and they right. got sued, and so they couldn't call the tape measure the Big Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Well, they did. I mean, they they manufactured it. I actually don't. I'm sure they had a. What do they call it now? I w- you know what I would have said if I lost that lawsuit? I would have just called it the Large Johnson. <laughs> so fuck, <laughs> fuck you guys. <laughs> but I mean, what a better, what, what, I mean, you can't come up with a better name for it. The tape. very large Johnson. I mean, I your big Johnson. Sue me over that. How big is your big Johnson? How big is your big Johnson? <laughs> the Johnson, Johnson formerly known as. Oh, this is going terribly, <laughs> terribly wrong. JJ, we love you. <laughs> so, so, so I came from a family of, you know, like, just roll up your sleeves, get shit done, right? There's no easy button right? Like work ethic, grit, resilience. I mean, there's a lot you 
learn from being in not just the industry they were in in an industrial industry but like watching how the business has gone through you know and did you did you work there as like a teenager and in high school and that kind of stuff or like explain sort of what, how it plays in your life yeah i mean so as a child so i moved to california when i was just before high school so i actually my first job was in mcdonald's that actually there's a stat i think that like 60 percent of fortune 500 executives their first job was in fast food so look that one up there's some some truth to that but as go a child go google it colin are you googling there is, it there is a stat <laughs> I don't know if it's 60 percent, but it's high. So, but my my whole childhood, like everything I remember, was in the plant, right, in the factory in Milwaukee, right, and like that's where I spent like most of my childhood. Like my playground was, which probably is like a huge OSHA violation, but like my playground was the factory, right, like jumping in the vials of the levels and just being around that. And I don't even think that it. I didn't really understand just being like subsumed in that environment i don't really think it took me years to really understand how that shaped me but you know watching you know watching my father and my uncle and um you know early days my grandfather and how they built this with their own hands and and the resilience and the you know the family element to it right so like business to me is is very personal because to me, business and family have always been intertwined, right? And so like, you, you can't actually separate the two because that's how I was brought up. So I, I very much have this, this notion of, you know, business and leadership and being in a company to me, it's, it's an extension of your family, right? And, and that's how I live my life and, you know, it's not- And is that, did, did, did growing up that way, did it make you tough like that and yeah. give you that headset? Yeah, I mean, it made me value. It made me value the resilience. Because you know, not not everybody has this. I, I I had this experience recently where a buddy of mine who's a CEO and um he sort of did what he did with his last company and and is now out looking. He sends me an email and he says, uh, "Hey, could you take a look at my resume and and give me your feedback on it?" So I sent him an email back and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not even going to look at your resume. And why the fuck do you have a resume? <laughs> <laughs> what are you true. doing with a resume? <laughs> what are you, you're not going to let them turn you into a candidate, are you? <laughs> you're not going to run through some nose-picking HR process, are you? People that do. And I said to him, I said, listen. I haven't had a resume since I, I think about 21. My resume ever since then, I, I know this sounds terrible, but it's true, is I'm Christopher fucking Lockhead. Like, yes. <laughs> right? So I have a theory on this. Is that like, I, I made this pact to myself that I would never have to interview for a job ever again. This was like 10 years ago because I was like the up and coming rock star. This was before I was a CMO, right? And I was always the one that was like, First in line for the promotion, always getting recruited, and maybe it was a bit arrogant. Once you're no longer up and coming, what are you? I don't know. An old has a Yoda. I'd like to say Yoda. <laughs> I'm aspiring to be Yoda. I'm somewhere between Luke Skywalker. No, but there's up and coming, and then you're like at the top, whatever that's called, right? The top of disillusionment. Like, look, it's a and garter. Then, and then there's when you're on your way down. What's <laughs> post on your way down? <laughs> Uh, hopefully, hopefully retired and really happy, whatever happy means to you. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's where I am. I, I'm, I'm whatever happens to you after you're on your way down. But I have a thing on resumes, right? So, I <laughs> so yeah, on resumes. So anyway, you know, my point to this guy was, you know, you should just sort of puff your chest up and say, Hey, listen, I don't have a resume. I'm, you know, I'm not going to say who the guy was and like, you know, Google me for the love of whoever you love. Yes. If you, if you are like in my experience, right, that I, I have to update my resume only because some HR process needs it to process my employment, right? Like you don't actually, like if you're writing a resume that you go and especially in these, this day of like social media and LinkedIn and networking, like why that, I agree. A resume to me is this antiquated thing that checks a internal compliance checkbox. And if you feel like you have to create one and like, like put it out there, right? Like I agree with you. I think this goes to the notion of like you have to stand for something. And as a as a person, you need to be the category designer of your life. And you have to figure out what you build your brand around, right? And what your point of view is. And if you're consistent and authentic to that, 
you don't need to interview anymore. And if you're interviewing, you're interviewing them. They're not interviewing you. That's the quote of the day right there, Chris. Jennifer Johnson. Amen. <laughs> That's what's Laying going on. it down. That's going on the tile. <laughs> so are people calling you JJ these days or are they calling you Jenny? I heard somebody was calling you Jenny. Are you Jenny from the block now or who are you now? Are we have different, is it, are you like a, you know, fighters? They, they take different name, nicknames at different parts of their careers or well, more like, are you like, are you yeah. like, you know, Prince when he changed himself into just a sim? What's going on with your name? <laughs> <laughs> So as growing up, I was always Jenny, right? And so if you knew me before the age of like 22, I was just Jenny Johnson, right? And then when I went into the working world, I thought, well, Jenny sounds like very, like a little girl with pigtails and I need to be taking, taken seriously. And so I'm going to change it to Jennifer. Like no one ever called me Jennifer my whole life. And then like very early into my career, in my first job out of college, someone you know, called me, they, they, my nickname was Kid Dynamite, like J.J. Walker from Good Times. I was, you know, a little like up and coming, you know, had some spunk to me, right? Like, you know, Dynamite, right? So I got the name J.J., right, from that. <laughs> and then it just stuck. So to the point where, like, it's funny, our friend Dave Peterson, when he was talking to me about joining Coverity, which where he was CMO, and then I, I was a, 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 his successor, he actually didn't, like, know me like someone was saying JJ or they, no, they were saying Jennifer Johnson and he only knew me as JJ. And so like he went through this whole yeah, process. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't know you were Jennifer Johnson until after we had worked together. Yeah. Well, no one calls me that. So I finally went back to this, like JJ is like my work persona. Right. And then, but like in my personal life, people never really called me JJ and they don't really know me as Jennifer. So I had this like slight identity crisis. So what I decided was in managing my own brand of me is that I'm JJ at work and I'm Jenny. I'm back to Jenny. <laughs> it's kind of like Coke, right? Coke so, but you, you as a CMO, you know a two brand strategy is really hard to pull off. You got to have one category positioning and brand here and a different category and positioning brand over there. You're, you know, you're right. You're right. Who, who so, goes drinking with me? Uh, well, that's a, actually, that's a good, there's elements of JJ and there's elements of Jenny because Jenny and JJ do converge into one, but I'd say the Jenny is like the kinder, <laughs> gentler, nicer, kind of goofy, funny. And then JJ is like, just like a kick-ass take no prisoners. Like, but you got to put those two. Yeah. People. Just add alcohol. <laughs> just add alcohol. Right. Right. Oh yeah. When you add alcohol with JJ, wowie, we wow. It's, it's primarily JJ. I mean, at this point too, now all my, my friends like have kind of in, informally adopted it over time. So I'd say it's JJ, if that's anything. Well, I, I, I think we should all be called whatever the fuck we want to be called. So um, what, do you want, like what do you want us to call you? Call me JJ. Okay, me. JJ. But you know, I have a very similar story. You know, when I first started, I was 18 and my partner Jack was 19. And so we're like, okay, well, no one's going to fucking take it seriously about anything, right? And so to your point on names, that's really when I became Christopher, because the only other time I was Christopher was when I was in shit with my mom. And so, you know, Christopher sounds more important or something. I don't know. Anyway, and, um, and we had these very formal looking business cards, you know, with our middle initials and shit on them. And, uh, and we grew beards. You know, <laughs> so we used our fancy names and, and uh, we grew beards and we... Uh, Oh, and then, well, we made up a guy too. That's, that's a different story. We named the company after a made up guy because we didn't think anybody would buy from us. But I, 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 I understand, uh, you know, the name thing. And, and um, did you ever grow a beard though? I never did. <laughs> Thank God, no. <laughs> I don't know. You know, the bearded lady. What do I know? I don't care. <laughs> You're, ter you're terrible. I, do. I have a lot of testosterone, but that's, no, that doesn't mean I'm growing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, hey, maybe let's go there. Why is it you're so comfortable with dudes? Yeah, you know, I've always the guys been love you, girl. Yeah, I've, I mean, I have female friends too, right? But I've always, I'm been sure, of course. Because you know, I just, I don't. You know, I think part of it is my upbringing, right? Like, don't take any shit, right? Like, gritty, right? And I just don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a feminine. Like, I'm not like a, like, I'm a guy's girl, like, I'm not feminine, right? So, like, I definitely can connect with women. But what I appreciate about guys is that this is a huge generalization, right? But 
you know, they don't deal, they don't, ha they don't have time for the drama and the bullshit and like, just say it like it is and be direct. And I've just got to this point in my life where like, I don't have energy to be anything but me and just say it like it is. But JJ, you were always that way. I don't ever remember. I don't know. How, how the fuck long have we known each other? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I mean, I've I mean, been a long, long enough time that I don't, I don't ever have any experience of some other I don't know what other description you'd give yourself, but that's how I would describe you. This is not like a new thing you're telling me. <laughs> no, but I, but when I, if you if you talk to people who knew me from college and that like high school, college, maybe into my early twenties a bit, they would probably they like, this is this has been kind of like the evolution of me. I've kind of grown into this being more direct like style. Um, I think I was I was always i've always been very nice i think i was always a people pleaser so this is the italian side of me so the other the other part of me is my mom is sicilian right so that probably is a little bit of the like you know fiery oh yeah no, no, nothing nothing explosive <laughs> happens nothing explosive yeah. happens when you mix german and italian <laughs> it's like a yeah. great yeah that's no. a wonderful combination i don't know maybe i need to read up on my history <laughs> but yeah exactly but you know i was I was like always kind of, you know, the number two, right? Like I, I was always the number two in the family or what do you mean the number two? Uh, I always had like, I had, had friends growing up that were really larger than life personalities and larger than mine. And I kind of like was okay stepping back and being number two and maybe a little bit in their shadow. And I think this was just like me growing up and you know, getting more confidence in life, but I, I don't think I had the, the, you know, the, the ball, so to speak, to like be more direct when I was younger. And so I think that was something that as so, I confidence. So, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but like, yeah. how do you go from somebody who's always the number two mm -hmm. to, and I'm going to say something, I know, you know, but um, you're probably not going to want me to say, but that you, I've been told from multiple people um, that you are the most sought after enterprise CMO in Silicon Valley right now. Thank you. No, really? Yeah. Like, I'm not bullshitting you. I wouldn't bullshit you. Right. And so, so help me understand, like, always number two to at least in the CMO world, you're actually in the field that you're in, you're it. Yeah. And I, I think, Part of that was just, you know, maturing as a person and getting older and getting, you know, really comfortable in your skin. I think in my early in my career, um, I always felt like even though I never gave myself enough credit, right? I always thought like I have to be the smartest person, the most like I was in product marketing, right? And I didn't wasn't an engineer. I, I was very good at product marketing, but I always had this like fear until I became comfortable enough in the role that they're going to know that I don't know, you know, I would go into a customer meeting and I would be so scared that they were going to ask a question that was so technically deep that I didn't know it, right? Because I thought I had to know everything, like the depth of an engineer. And so that really like, that kind of almost that fear held me back. And it was, it honestly took, and I'll say, you know, Michelle Feaster, right? And she's so, so hold on a sec. So, so what yeah. you just said was confidence. Yeah. And confidence around, in this case, technical knowledge. But how much of it do you think was really confidence around technical knowledge? And how much of it was your own bullshit with yourself, just, you know, holding yourself back, not, not wanting to take that final jump? Oh, it was 99.9% .9 holding myself back. Yeah. I was the only person holding myself so back. So why the fuck do we do that? I mean, you, you at uh, those moments, you're already at a place in your career where, you know, you're the woe man, so to speak, and, um, but yet holding back. And of course, we all do it. We all have those moments where we're in a position to, to be our greatest self, and, um, and, and then we all have hesitations in some of those moments. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is, you know, our surroundings shape us. So I think certain cultures, certain, you know, people that you worked with, certain bosses that you had, like- they Easy, can, easy. Yeah. What? No, I'm not saying <laughs> thank you. No, but for good and bad, right? I mean, they, they shape what is normal, right? And they shape the norm of like yeah. what is valued. And I think there's that with, you know, there, there's, and a I think, don't you don't see if this makes sense to you, JJ. I, 
you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I work for so-and-so and they taught me everything not to do. And they, they'll talk about the value, if you will, of working for a shitty boss. And well, I get that. And I've had that. And, and you do learn from, hey, I'm never going to do that. You know what that person did. But in my experience, there's nothing like working for a legendary boss and particularly in an organization inside a company that is led by an organ, a legendary leader. And it, oftentimes I have found it's, it's not necessarily your direct boss, but who the leader of the organization you're in or in, in a smaller organization, the CEO herself. But, but that when you see a fucking amazing executive up close, pull some real shit down, put some real moose on the hood, I don't know. You tell me, but that's when I've learned the most. Like, wow. Yep, I I agree. I mean, I think. And so I think your boss matters, and the leader of your organization matters a ton. Agreed. And I mean, you know, let's go back to Mercury, right? That's where my that's where my career really like like the trajectory of my career changed at Mercury. And what, I think what it, makes you say that? It it was when I. I moved from being, I think there's a couple things. One, it was when I moved from being an individual contributor to a manager, right? So that was like a big shift for me. I think it was like learning, you know, and I, it's it, learning not just the right way, but learning the freaking legendary way to do things. Like so much of what you did and what you all did and like all the leaders in that company of like, this is how you do product. This is how you do marketing. This is how you build a category. This is how you run campaigns. Like all of that, I still use all of that today, to this day. There is still a need for that. As do I. I learned so much there. I learned more there than anywhere else. Oh, yeah. it, you, it was amazing. The whole thing was amazing, right? And it was- What a team. Why do you think it was so special? Well, I, I mean, it was from the top down, right? The leadership was, was like, just take no prisoners, awesome. Like, A- players i mean i can't actually think of any I, this is like it was a unicorn company in that and that i can't actually think back to a role within mercury of anyone that i interfaced with that wasn't an a player in their role you just couldn't survive but 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 the people weren't assholes right and i think a lot of it it was tough as shit people, though it was, it was really tough, tough. and the thing i loved about mercury greatest culture i'd ever been associated with for sure a uh, great culture at science another company i was at amazing but Mercury was, was in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very special place. And, you know, that Peter Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You know, and I remember when this shit went down with United Airlines, you know, they tore the guy off the plane and the yep. CEO idiot Munez came on and said, oh, you know, this is a training problem. This is a procedural problem. Like, no, you dumb fuck. This is a culture problem. You have a shitty company. Yep. Did you ever see the core values written on the wall at Mercury? Yeah, absolutely. They were written. Weren't they written on the wall? No. Are you telling me no? Yeah, they were. Weren't they? Wait, oh, where? Maybe oh, they were. Right. Were they in the ladies' uh, washroom? Maybe that's why I never saw. I guess, I guess they weren't. You're right. Actually, they weren't. Well, well but let me play devil's advocate to that because we have our values written on the wall at Tenable. No, no, I'm not arguing that you should or you shouldn't. I'm not suggesting that you should or you shouldn't put them on the wall. But what I am suggesting is that whether they're on the wall or not, that where culture shows up is in conversations and actions. Right. You're right. And You're so right. there was nobody at Mercury who was confused that, ta-da, here you produce legendary results. Yes. You know, okay. when, when Joe Sexton, our head of sales, stands up and says with his accent, which I'll try to do and make do a terrible job of, he says, well, there's two kinds of salespeople here at Mercury. <laughs> New ones and rich ones. <laughs> right? Yeah. Everybody's, everybody is, uh, to quote Jay Larson, nobody's confused. We're not confused, right? Nobody's yeah. confused. And it was the same thing in engineering. And so, and through ultimately throughout the company, right? So everybody knew this company was about winning. Everybody knew we execute with uh, military precision. Right. And everybody knew that we loved winning and we would win and move on to the next one and on to the next one. We, we would celebrate a little, but not much and keep going. 
Now that's an interesting thing on winning. Cause I think you can, we were good winners. You can be sore winners and you can win by, I mean, there's always this element of, you know, the competition, right. And having an enemy. What do you think and, it means to be a good winner? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not disrespectful, right? Like I, you're not, you're not doing it by like, you know, kicking someone when they're down, right? Like if you lead with your position of strength, like you don't need to go and, you know, degrade whatever that means, your competition, right? And I think it's about having respect at the end of the day. Like I've worked for people that they love to poke other competitors straight in the eye. And I think it's fine to do that in a respectful, I think there's ways to do it. I've never understood that. See, because I think when you do that, the, comp the competition is the context of the conversation. Yeah. You're and valid. I want us to be the context of the conversation. Yep. And so that's why I believe the different versus better conversation wins. So the, you know, the prospect or customer says, oh, well, you know, we were just at Carbidingulation Corporation and we really like their new carbidingulator and they're this and they're that and all that. Well, oh yeah, that's great. What we do is actually different from that. Yep. Yeah. And then you don't, ha it, to that point, you don't have now, to. Now I'm going to, I'm going to, as I, ex don't be, don't be confused. I'm not Mother Teresa. As I explain our difference, I'm going to crush them by putting them yes. in a horrible position. Under com yes. Exactly. But I'm not going to, what I'm not going to do is say, oh yeah, well, um, you know, they are five minute abs and we're four minute abs. I'm not, that's a dumb conversation. That's right. I'm curious what you guys think about the Uber's tactics with Lyft. I mean, I think, well, I think. I, what, what, do you, what, what do you mean, Colin? Well, there was, there were a lot, there was a campaign. Uh, there were a number of campaigns. Uber was involved in, in sort of sabotaging Lyft. Well, I think uh, it's. On, on a number of levels. Culture. I think it actually speaks to what we were talking about before is when you have, you know, bad press, crisis, whatever. I think that it's an opportunity and a necessity for companies to go back and look at their core values and their culture. And I think a lot of the things that you're seeing with Uber right now in the news stem from the fact that they have these deep seated systemic cultural issues and it manifests itself in different ways. Some of it might be did, what did, did you hear the break? It. Did you hear the breaking news? Well, what, which today? Yeah. Uh, Uber and United Airlines are merging. <laughs> 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 that would be something. <laughs> yeah, they could probably take a, probably not a page from each other's uh, comms books, but but no, I think it's a good point of like that's I think one way that it manifests itself is you know poking other people in the eye versus having something that's unique and different. And honestly, I, I said this before all this everything was happening with Uber in the news is like I'd be interested in your gut your perspective on this. Both of you is like you know, has a category king emerged from those two yet? Because I, I, I would think a lot of people would say Uber. I don't think so. And I would, I said that actually at a talk before all this stuff went down. And what do you guys think? I don't think so. And what do you think is going to happen? Like if you have a crystal ball, like looking a couple of years down the road, what, what happens between Uber and Lyft? I think it's a matter of funding and the Uber seems to have a lot more. So it would seem to me that at some point Lyft will get squashed, but it could be a long time. I mean, in, in that business, funding matters. There's no question. It's a huge factor. Uh, I, I, I think there, this is a very important thing to tease out and unpack. Um, because I think if you don't, then you might miss what's going on. Uh, so here's, here's what I think is going on. Um, we have the rare situation where a, one of the biggest new categories uh, designed in modern times is exploding. And you had a category king who was prosecuting the Magic Triangle, also product company category, incredibly well, who was the primary designer of the category. And of course, that company's Uber. And if you remember, categories go through three stages. Um, and this category is still in the middle stage. And this is normally where the category king destroys everybody else and, and stands alone. And this category is tough to do that in because of the physical nature of it. It's, it's like it's a, it's a retail thing. You know, you can only open so many stores. There's a physical, you know, you can only mobilize so many vehicles in so many cities. But they're doing an extraordinary job doing that. Now, all that said, Lyft has done an unbelievable job.
And so you have a rare situation where the category has not matured yet. It's still in a very hyper growth mode. And on the magic triangle, product, company, and category, you have this rare situation where the emerging category king is fucking up big time on one of the three, which is company. Mm -hmm. And what makes this so rare is how close Lyft follows them. So Lyft has an extraordinary opportunity to actually steal the category from the guys at Uber because their position as category king is not locked and loaded. The offerings are close enough. And um, if one company can prosecute all three components of the magic triangle, they're going to win. If there was no Lyft, Uber, Uber continues. Remember, when, when Netflix fucked up, Netflix keeps going. When there's a category king and a giant category and there's no viable alternative and, and they fuck up on, you know, in this case, company, you can't unsee it. A great example is Lululemon. The founder of Lululemon comes out and says all this horrible stuff about women's behinds, right? It's like, um, hello, who, who buys your fucking product and why do they buy it, you dumb fuck, right? And, 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 and it's a horrible company. They continuously miss their numbers on Wall Street. and it, it, It's a mess as a company, but there's no real viable competitor that's emerged yet, right? So they remain the category king. In the case of Uber, there's a strong viable competitor sitting there. And yeah. so Lyft has an extraordinarily rare opportunity. And I think, JJ, there's a chance that there's enough anger towards Uber that they, that they pull it out. There's a chance. They're going to have to execute flawlessly, and they're probably going to need a bunch of luck. But there's a real chance for them. Did you know they, they partnered with McDonald's? Lyft does? Uber, Uber just does. partnered with McDonald's. That was announced uh, just last week. To, to bring you your burger? <laughs> yeah, with U U Uber Eats. McDonald's will satisfy your Big Mac craving with Uber Eats. So it seems to me if they can get partnerships. Wow, that's a great service right now. Do you know of any, other, do you know of any, any major <laughs> partnerships with the Lyft has in place? Maybe they can also partner with Lululemon, right? And so you can Big Macs and you need to buy Lululemon, but that you can't fit. Yeah, and we suggest based on the size of your McDonald's order that you size up in the Lulus. And that's where the, your lift comes in. You super size yoga pants. <laughs> exactly. Get the ones with the extra stretch. A little, a, a little more namaste for the dollar. <laughs> and I am someone I can namaste, I can namaste in place. My shit back there. I can joke about that because I'm a woman with a big ass, so it's okay. I can, I can. <laughs> hey, hey. Speaking of asses, I, I've been, I've been oh, waiting for somebody to bring this up. Watch it out. <laughs> Here we go. Segway. Speaking of asses, JJ, do you notice today everybody in business is a badass? Everybody's a badass today. You think that's true? Well, you hear the word badass all the time. Is it like badass rock star? Yeah, like, like oh, yeah, you know, yeah, J J yeah. Jennifer Johnson's a badass CMO. Like, badass. Yeah. I, I hear it all the time. Colin, you hear it all the time, don't you? Of course. And so what I wonder is, okay, well... If there's a, such a thing as a badass, is there a good ass? <laughs> no, it's just a dumbass. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. If there's a dumbass, like we have a smart ass, there's yeah, a smart there's ass and a dumbass. Yeah. So if there's a badass, why isn't there a good ass? Well, there is good ass, but it's in a totally different context. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> there you have it then. Out the tubes here. Well, and the other one I want, I've never understood this. It's like, okay, team, we're going to take the field and we're going to play full out. Nobody's going to do this half assed. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, uh, okay, JJ, you're a business leader. Do you ever get up in front of your company or your team and you say, okay, team, we're going to go out there and we're going to do this thing and we're going to do it one way, full assed. <laughs> So why is it sometimes there's the, there's the opposite of the coin, smart ass, dumb ass, but like there's no corollary with half ass and full ass or bad ass and good ass. That's, I guess, my question. Yeah. 
Well, I think that it's, this is a great opportunity to define a new category around what a good ass is. Yeah, there she goes. Right? Because I think everyone wants to be that like, that like outlaw, renegade, like ninja, right? Like all those words you hear. And like, that doesn't sound like good ass. Cause good ass is like, I'm a nice guy, right? No one doesn't seem like people want to ever be the nice guys, right? It's like the, you know, the people who like to break all the rules. Does, does that mean we should call those people the nice asses? <laughs> 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 no, but like, but I think this is a, like, I, here, this is not my mission. Is I'm going to define what it means to be a good ass. Because I think that the yeah. nice can still finish. Jennifer work. Johnson is a good ass. That's right. Because nice guys finish Imagine last, if you right? said that, if you said that, what would, what would happen down in HR, I wonder? <laughs> I'm a good ass. I have a good yeah. ass. I'm good. I don't know. Hey, uh, my, my boss, Jennifer Johnson, just told me I was a good <laughs> ass. Mm. Well, well, let nice guys finish last. Why does that have to be the case? We all heard that. That's like the saying that everyone knows, right? Nice guys finish last. Well, maybe nice guys can finish first, right? Maybe the nice guys. There you go. Them. And Kumbaya, yeah. my lord. Yeah. Hey, it's the emergence of the new category called the good ass. I'm the right. good ass. All right. Let's. Yeah. We'll. Um. We should start the podcast. Good ass. The good ass podcast. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like our lightning strike right now. Exactly. <laughs> that would be the name of the episode, the good ass episode. Yeah. Only, By the way, only good you, asses should tune in. I have to tell you, like, not to not to tip the hand of what we're doing at Tenable, but like I will say, Amit, our CEO, had ordered ordered Play Bigger. Hold on. Some of my favorite books are here, but everybody read this book. Shameless plug for Play Bigger. But our CEO bought like this book in bulk for every leader in the entire company. So like every, every director and op has this book and it's great because when you, when you, we use zoom a lot cause we're geographically distributed and you could actually see this book. It's almost like people have it as props in their, in the background. It's awesome. And everybody's using the terminology from the book. It's awesome. They're like, wait, when are we, are we going to do a lightning strike? Like who's this? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like unbelievable to see how much this book has like permeated into our culture in a very short period of time. That's so, great. Yeah. We've created the monster. Yes. How awesome is that? It's great. And, it's and cool. you know, uh, I've probably said it too many times, but, you know, doing a book like that, you know, for me, it was, it's my life's work. And, and it took about two years. And so it's, it, it sort of starts to feel like a startup at some point, right? Because you're working on this product and, uh, you're trying to get some feedback on it, you know, friends and family. And, and in our case, we had a, both an agent and a publisher and they kept telling us all this great stuff, but sooner or later they start to feel like your mom telling you you're handsome, you know? Anyway, I guess my point in all this is, you know, you, you, you bust your ass for two years to pour your life's work into 270 pages. And to just think that what you just said is true, you know, it just, it, it, I don't know. I don't know what to say other than that's fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, your, your work was not in vain. Like that's the message, right? Like you, you put your heart and your soul and your wisdom and your experience into 270 pages, which I'm sure was a huge process in and of itself, right. To distill it down to that even, um, and, and write it in a way, right. That like people can actually use it as a framework, right. Like that, it, and it's, it's not, it, this is not smoke and mirrors. This is not fluff, right? Like I have seen it. I have lived it. I am living it. Like it's real shit. And like, if there's one thing I can impart to like, to CMOs is that like, if you want to differentiate yourself, I think there's two things. It's like, if you really want to be a CMO and have a real seat at the table, category design is the next big skill you have to learn because what it will do is it'll actually transcend you from being a good functional marketing like exec leader to a, a strategic business executive. Because this process is about aligning all three sides of the triangle. And it's getting, it's getting the CEO and the CTO and the product team and everybody to align around the story, right? That, and it's not just a story, it's a strategy, right? And like, it's real shit and it's hard. And it, like this book, is a way to help navigate that. And the process, like 
you know, if someone is going to like argue with you, let them argue with the process, not you, right? As JJ CMO, me going in and trying to instill this, it's like this book gives you the armor to go drive this, right? And when, and it's about then arguing and debating the process, not my opinion on it anymore. Well, and the interesting thing about all that on the argument side is at first when people hear the category makes the company, the category makes the brand, not the other way around. It, it, it really starts to F with people's heads and they want to argue it. You know, you think about the marketers who spend so much on branding and I'm not throwing branding under the bus. Branding's very important. And I actually think I know a little bit about that shit. Um, and I think it's incredibly important. However, the category makes the brand. Kodak has a legendary brand. No one gives a fuck. In 1999, Dell brand, awesome. 2017, no one cares. Why? Category violence. It's all, all the categories have moved. They do the exact same thing. And so, so the thing that I, you know, I really hope in all of this, JJ, is that when people understand there's three levers, not two, right? They can pull product, company, and category. That categories can be designed. You can make your place in the world. And when there are enough category designers out there, we will have more companies um, that are successful because they've been able to find their niche where they can be successful. That's right. Have you, I totally agree. I don't want to segue, but I had to bring this up. Have you ever read this book, Daniel Pink, A Whole New Mind? Um, no. I read, what's his other book called? Um, I don't know. Uh, I read one of his books. I don't, it's, I don't think it's that one. He's got another one that was awesome, uh, Daniel Pink. Yeah, you should read this uh, book. Is, 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 did he write Think, Think Fast and Think Slow at the same time or something? Was what, what, he that? He might have. I don't know. It's, it's been a same. couple of scotches since then, JJ. Yeah, it's, but, but the reason I, I bring so this why, up. Yeah, why do you bring up A Whole New Mind? So like this is, this is a book, after everybody reads Play Bigger, everybody should read this book because I think there are some interesting concepts in this book that support why category design is so important. And the whole premise, he has an amazing point of view that's laid out in this book. But basically what his whole point of view is, is that we're moving from the information age into what he's calling the conceptual age. And all the things in the information age that were held valuable were all very left-brained, linear types, logical types of, of things, right? Accountants, right? Numbers, right? All of that was, was what was valued, the left brain thinker. And he says there's three megatrends that are happening that are making this, tr like transitioning this to this conceptual age, which is all about the right brain. The first is it's Asia, abundance, and automation are his three megatrends, right? And did you say Asia, a a Asia like? Like offshoring, right? So these are his three things, Got Asia, it. abundance, and automation. And Asia is basically, you know, you can do the same job for $15,000 a year that you pay a knowledge worker here, 250000 right? So this concept of, of off offshoring and right, getting, you know, maybe not the same output, but relatively the same for, for a lot less money. Um, the second is automation, right? All those things that were valued before, right, are all now being automated um, you know, you've got, yeah, and of course that that's been going on for a long time, that's been going on for a long time, but abundance is the other one. I think that maybe that's what triggered this whole thing is like, we have so many choices now, right? It's easier than ever to start a company. It's easier than you've got like 15 gazillion brands of toothpaste on the shelf. Like there's abundance. You go into these mega shopping malls, right? And you, everything now is like, you know, it's no longer enough to produce a, you know, a good quality product. Like now everything that's differentiating in this world is What's all going on with colors? Why do I have to know what chartreuse means? I don't even know what that, what the hell is that? <laughs> Design when I was a kid, it was what? It was pink and yellow and red and blue and brown and yeah. green. And now no, there's a million, there right? Is. Yes, there is, because it's a way to differentiate. But, but to that point... But that's what's happening everywhere, and that's exactly the point, right, is that uh, new niches are created yes. when they're distinguished. That's right. 
That's right. But the but the the skills that are going to be important in the conceptual age, as Daniel Pink says, is are things like design, right? It's about experience. It's about storytelling. It's about context. It's about wow, all. Wow, this could stuff. get this could get really good. Right? Well, no, but it, like, <laughs> shit could get really good. You mean guys with spreadsheets aren't going to run the real world anymore? Yeah, right. So you're going to get like you know these like like people like me. I'm very not lucky. jobs with guitars and paintbrushes and. Yeah. So maybe to answer your question of why I and I appreciate that nice accolade. Why? I'm one of the most sought after CMOs in the Valley is because I actually think you're the most, but anyway, keep going. I have, I have tapped into my left brain when I need it, but I am a right brain thinker. And I think that the CMOs and the executives that understand how to be right brain are going to rule. And now I was that's, looking- that's counter to a lot of what we hear, right? What we hear is uh, big data science and marketing, marketing data science, uh, AI, chatbots, uh, robots and hot toddies and I don't know what, um, <laughs> you know, it's all coming at us. And of course, Gartner, a few years ago, Gartner group came out and said, you know, by, I think it was 2020, but whatever, it, whatever year it was by such and such a year, the CMO was going to have a bigger IT budget than the CIO. And, and, and so there's been all this talk for a very long time that uh, it's, it's the left brain that's going to be the C. Uh, M O uh, and the right brain guys are, are going to take it in the, you know, the hoo hoo. So if, if you subscribe to Daniel Pink's thinking is that that's going to shift and that, well, my, my personal point of view on it is there's more data than ever. And I think that companies that understand how to harness that data to provide new services and customer experiences, that is truly a differentiator, but you still have to actually connect with people and you still have to tell a story and you still have to make it relevant and in context and no amount of big data is going to help you do that. And so, you know, you could say that the, the, the next generation of CMOs will be these conceptual thinkers. You could also say there's a new role emerging in the company and that's the chief category officer. And that is the right brain thinker that augments the left brain CM data driven CMO. That's and, and just so I'm clear, who works for who? Does the CMO work for the category designer, or does the category designer, your category chief category officer, work for the CMO? Their peers, I believe they. Oh. I think it could be done right that the chief category officer is a new executive role that is cross functional in wow. nature that reports to the CEO. And that is a peer to the chief product officer and the CMO and the chief revenue officer and wow. ties all those things together. How about that? You said it here. You said it now. <laughs> How about that? There it is. So, so you said it was the, at the beginning of the conversation, JJ, you said it was the number one thing. And now I hear that it might be the number one, two, and three thing. <laughs> Yeah, it really, it is. And I think, we're- you know, it is interesting. I mean, it's been a long, it's, it's, it's fascinating for me to hear you say this because it's been a very long time since I was in the game um, as a CMO and, and um, it, it was not on the spec, you know, it's been, actually, I'm trying to remember last time I was, I don't know, it's, it's been a very long time since I actually, uh, was on the market, so to speak. It would have been, uh, yeah, I don't even want to say it's embarrassing. So yeah, there's, but it wasn't on the spec, you know, 15 years ago, there's not a chance it was on the spec. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my question given that is why do you think category design or category strategy, however you want to think about it, but category design has gone from what are you even talking about? It doesn't even exist. Like we don't even know it's there. Like it's some, new um chemical discovered by scientists for the first time like it doesn't it just doesn't exist to now you're telling me it's the number one thing that um when you're out there talking to companies about maybe being their cmo they want to talk about yeah so i i think it's a good question um i think that the elements of category design are things that executives have done inherently probably on some level right my roots coming from product marketing a lot of the positioning and point of view and we all know categories bigger than that right but that is one component of of the category is your point of view like those are just inherent skills that as a product marketer like i grew up doing right and so that's just one example of you know and like a you know i had a product is thinking about 
their ecosystem and in, in their, their partner alliances and what they're going to build organically versus what their M&A and corp dev strategy might be. So like, I think a lot of these things were like, like organically happening in a company. I think what, what category design and what, what play bigger did was actually put a category around it. You put a container and a framework that allowed people to understand how it, how to implement it. Like, and, and actually have a framework around some of the things that maybe they were already doing, you know, maybe not well or well, but in an ad hoc manner, like to align the whole team. Like the art, to me, one of the arts of category design is probably the biggest art is getting everyone to freaking agree, right? Like, you know how it is. Like you've got egos and agendas and like, like strong opinions all around the table, right? And Category design forces the entire team to decisions, decisions that they probably have been avoiding for years because they can't fucking agree. So like if you can get all the pieces of that triangle working in concert, that's when the magic happens. That is part of the reason why Mercury was so freaking awesome is because all those pieces were aligned. Yeah. And it's not like some nose picky uh, trade off bullshit or compromise way compromise approach to play. it's none of that stuff right it's if we're all very once you get clear about the following things number one what it takes to be successful is to prosecute the magic triangle product company and category right you got to get that right and the company that gets that right is going to get 76 percent of the economics and so we are in a winner take all game and we also understand because of the way the data works, uh, uh, the, the, in particular, what we call the IPO sweet spot, which um, sort of turns into uh, what we call the 610 law. That is to say, the companies in the technology industry that create enduring value, that is to say, they uh, deliver uh, growth in their value or stock price past their closing price on day one of their trading, those companies all go public in six to 10 years. So what am I saying? Once an executive team gets clear, number one, one, one company in our space is going to get two thirds of the economics. We're committed to being that company. Number two, the way you do that is you get a category design strategy. You have to have a point of view. You have to educate the market. The E and CEO stands for evangelist. You got to build an ecosystem. You got to do all that awesome shit, right? And they understand that you have six to 10 years to prosecute the magic triangle, solve a giant problem that matters deliver a shit ton of value and get public and ultimately create enduring value. Once everybody understands that's the fucking game, clarity starts to set in. Mm -hmm. But getting everyone to agree that that's the fucking game is really hard. Really, really fucking hard. And, and I got to tell you, you know, and I, I can't speak for the other guys, but um, it's a big part of why I wanted to write the book because there was always this construct in my head. And so I knew, I knew what I was doing. There was a playbook in my head. And no matter what, it was almost impossible for me to sort of get it out to get people to understand. They, I could get them to understand the next move or the next two moves, but ultimately how this would play out. And, you know, as you, and then when you start to study that categories all do this over and over, it's so, it's so pattern driven. Mm -hmm. It is. And All of a sudden, you develop the ability to, you know, see the future, right? One of my old jokes used to be, well, I got two balls and neither one of them are crystal. Well, I got maybe a quarter of a crystal one now. <laughs> That's just because you're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, son, when you get old, sometimes you have to have a crystal ball put in. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true like when you start to look at like the category life cycle and you start to map companies and markets in it like you see that you, it's it's not it, it like the answer's there right it's just about like like seeing it, it from that lens it's pretty cool i mean you you guys should be and i know you're very proud but like like this was more than like the work that you have done is making a difference in the industry and you know, I would put category design in the defined like phase of the category life cycle still, right? Like it's still- Yeah, I think we're emerging. way early. Yeah, yeah. We're way early. Um, but you know, it's interesting to, cause you just never know where any of these things go, right? It, it, um, it's very clear as we sit here today to me that uh, category design has hit a major, major inflection point. And 
the, the only way I know I can measure that, I mean, we get book sales, you know, twice a year or something from our publisher. I don't fucking know. Uh, but so, you know, there's whatever that is. But what I can see is just the inbound, you know, the amount of Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and where it's coming from. And, you know, I mean, when somebody from South Africa sends you a LinkedIn message, and tells you how much of a difference that this thing's making. It's like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And you probably see, if you get one tenth or one one hundredth, you, you hear one one hundredth of all, like everyone you've touched, you probably hear it, you know, one out of every hundred people is going to actually tell you what a difference you made. So. I, I l listen, officer, I didn't touch her on purpose. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you a category design question? Cause this is one that I, this is a question I get a lot and I want to, I want to at least, I don't think it, I want to get your opinion on it. So in a world of unconstrained budget, time, mind share, everything, of course, going out and defining a new category is the right thing to do because you're setting the agenda versus walking into an agenda someone else has set. Is there ever, is there ever a time or a situation in a company's life or whatever, where it's actually a better strategy to go and try to revive a stagnant category that already exists versus defining a brand new one. I'd love your perspective on that. Oh, I think a dead category can come back. Yeah, for sure. You weigh dead before it comes back. Yeah, I think, and, and we've seen it. You see it in fashion. Um, the cost. But you, yeah, absolutely. And then you see it, uh, you know, probably, I don't know if it's my favorite, 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 but certainly one of them is um, uh, what BMW did with Mini Cooper. And they defined uh, what I loved about what they did was the vehicle wasn't so much a new category, if you will, a subcompact. So that, that wasn't really new. But what they did was actually very fascinating to me from the perspective of category design, which is they did they designed a new term in in uh the experience for customers right they took the british word motoring and they centered their category design on motoring and they distinguished themselves by arguing that driving and commuting were not the same as motoring and so they distinguished the experience you have as a new way to think about um, driving. And that's way different than marketing a feature. You know what I'm saying? They didn't market a feature of the product. Another, uh, uh, uh this is an individual who's done this and is fucking genius. So I have a buddy named Hal Elrod and Hal wrote a book. Hal's a former sales guy, very talented, very incredible on stage, great public speaker. And so today he's an author and public speaker uh, and podcaster. He runs, uh, his podcast is one of the biggest podcasts in the world. It's called Achieve Your Goals. Anyway, he writes this book called The Miracle Morning. And he doesn't so much do category design for himself as an author and a speaker and a podcaster. He does the same thing BMW did, which is he actually creates a new category called what you do in the first hour of your day matters. And so there's a set of shit that if you do in the first hour of your day, that's been proven is going to make a material difference in the quality of your day. And if you do that every fuck day, that'll be the quality of your life. And he's got this wonderful, easy to read book that kind of gives you some of ideas around what you should be doing uh, when you first get up to kind of set yourself up to have a great day. It's a very simple fucking idea. Okay. And it's very wonderfully told. But my point in all that is what Hal did was created a new category called everybody who reads that book changes what they do first thing in the morning. And as a result, Hal started a movement and there are all these miracle morning, you name it, there's miracle morning for college students and miracle morning for, you know, people who have a twitchy ear on Thursday. And I mean, there's miracle mornings <laughs> up the kazoo and there's all these Facebook groups and like there's a zillion people on his mail list. And like, it's a thing, it's a community. It's a true, it's what Mike Maples, uh, the venture capitalist, 
calls a movement. Mike says he wants to invest in, in entrepreneurs who are creating movements. Well, fucking how design is the category designer of a movement. Yeah. And that's cool shit right there. Yeah. I mean, isn't like if you're doing something different that matters and building a new category, I mean, a movement, like to me, that's one of the signs that, you know, it's working, right? Is that you, you create this following a movement, whatever you want to call it. And if you think about, you know, maybe elucidate on, on why you wanted to join Tenable because you saw there was something there you really related to in yeah. terms of the difference that it could make in terms of a, you know, a movement, a new way of thinking about stuff. That's right. That's right. And value and what the, va what the value what values were. I mean, like in the middle of, like we talked about like category and brand and does one like, you know, does the tail wag the dog or whatever, right? Like category, like the brand is everything, right? The brand is all three of those sides of the magic triangle. In my perspective, it's, it's every touch point you have with the company. And so I think that, you know, category does wind up shaping your brand, but like right there in the middle is like your core values. And, and maybe you can put that on the company side, but like the other thing category design really does is make you like really clear as a company on who you are and what you stand for and what your value system is. And I think some of these companies that, you know, have culture issues aren't clear on their, either they're not clear on their values or their values are misaligned with like, what their employees are experiencing, right? So I think that's, that goes back to like, the other thing when I was interviewing companies, I was interviewing the CEO, but I was also interviewing the values of the company because, you know, that matters, right? And the CEO in many times drives the values of the company. And if you don't have alignment there, it doesn't matter that you, like, you're always gonna be out of whack. Right. And, and, and you know, it, it's funny because uh, when you have people who you ever been out, maybe like at a business dinner or something like that, and maybe someone else gets the bill and you just happen to notice they like give a real shitty tip or, or anything like that. When you see somebody who you respect and admire and but then you see them do a little shitty thing, but it's 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 a thing that's kind of off your core values. I actually think those little shitty things are very, very big tells. Mm -hmm. Because they're the things that people do when they don't think anyone is looking. That's right. Yep. And they have weird motivations for them. Yep. Like when people do shitty little things, generally it's a weird motivation of some kind. Yep. I think that people can, you know, put on whatever face and show that they want in public or in certain situations that they control. But I agree with you. I think it's always like, like someone told me, always look at people's shoes, right? Like you might've even said that. I don't know, maybe you said that before, but someone said that to me. It's like, you always wanna look at people's shoes because that actually tells you a lot about like, th like not only like, like a lot of times when people have shitty shoes, like they might have a nice outfit, but they forget about the shoes. And, like, and then they have like these worn out, shitty, crappy looking shoes. So I don't know if that's a statement of their value system, but it does show you like, you know, do they, do they think things through in detail, right? Like, do they have a commitment to quality? I don't know what that tells you, but, but it's the little, like, I, I guess know for sure it tells you they're wearing shitty shoes. <laughs> I'm not sure. There's some things we, maybe we could read into it, but I, I, I would hesitate and yeah. try to be less judgmental although of course don't wear so much shitty shoes although most of the time i don't wear shoes anymore don't you have some red shoes that you used to wear oh that's what it was the red shoes that's what it was yeah yes i used to in the mercury days every every big talk i gave i that's wore my red prada shoes me and the pope <laughs> at the time and although that, I was doing it before the Pope, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> and what, 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 what? And I remember um, uh, I had the privilege of um, uh, having a dialogue with um, Secretary, Madam Secretary, um, on stage at Mercury World, Madeleine Albright. And we had very similar uh, colored shoes. There's a very funny picture of me because I look like King Kong and she looks like Fay Ray, you know, because she's, she's not. Um, a very vertical person. <laughs> it, She's a good uh, ass. She's a good uh, ass. She, was, she gave a hell of a speech. And uh, whatever your politics are, her, her uh, demeanor is a, 
as a human being was uh, off the charts. But anyway, yeah, there's this very cute picture of, of both of us looking down, comparing our shoes on stage in front of, I don't know how many thousand people. It was a lot of people at Mercury World. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> Uh, so yeah no I, I used to have the actually i still have them i just i don't wear them anymore they're retired so was it was the red shoes your what, what was that to you was that like a, a statement as like that you were trying to send out when you were speaking or that's, was what, that that's what he decided he was a badass yeah no that, actually <laughs> uh a friend of mine said uh I, I can't remember why I bought them. You know, my ex-wife was really into fashion and, and for quite a while in her life had a shoe store, although it was women's shoes. So, um, you know, that was always around. And I don't know, I, I can remember shopping and seeing these red Prada shoes and thinking they were kind of out there. And I thought, well, maybe you wear them at a party or something. And then the first speech I ever gave at Mercury, uh, I don't remember why. I just thought, I think... Oh, I do now. Uh, um, somebody said to me, you can't just go on stage. You have to wear something that warns people. Right? You have to, you have to, when you walk on stage, you have to give them a warning. Because you're you or just because? Yeah, they have to know like, okay, There's this guy is not, you know, with all due respect to CFOs, this is not going to be like a regular CFO speech. And I wasn't a CFO, of course, but like that I, that, that, it wasn't fair to show up and not warn them first that my physical presence needed to say, strap yourself look, in, look, look out. it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wore them once and then I gave another speech and I didn't wear them. And everybody said, hey, where the fuck are the red shoes? And so from that point on, I had to wear the red shoes all, uh, at every Mercury speech. All right. Okay. And then, uh, and then when I went up on stage uh, at the very end at the celebration party and the integration with uh, Hewlett Packard, that was the last time I wore. Got it. Well, you have to, but you have to like break them out at some point in the future. Whatever I guess there will be some occasion that will call for it. I love it. I, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe when I get invited to speak at the United Nations. <laughs> We should put, you should put them on the wall there on the back behind you. That's a great idea. I could maybe hang them on this, this big ass pipe. Yeah. This badass. This is a badass pipe. Oh yeah. We forgot big ass. You're going to be a big ass. Big ass. Yeah. yeah. Nobody but says, Oh, that person's a small ass. ass. There's no small ass. <laughs> no one says, Oh, I'll have the small ass hot dog. They say, we'll have the big <laughs> ass hot dog. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's get, I'm going to be the good, the good ass CMO. You're the good. Good ass CMO. Jennifer Johnson, good ass CMO. Right. <laughs> Can you get some business cards that say that? I'm going to. I'd like love it. to like hang out at a trade show and just kind of walk behind you and try to be inspicuous in, in, in hmm. and just see what happens when you hand people the card that says JJ, good ass CMO. Yeah, that's going to be my tagline. Be a good ass. There you go. Yeah. Hey, I love it. Hey, Chris, does your lock does your new quick bad business card say Christopher fucking lock it on? <laughs> Actually, have to, it, have to reorder them. It doesn't, but that's a great idea. I do have our have our friend for our friend Brian Barons who who designed the Legends and Losers logo designed me the most legendary business cards I've ever had. Um, they're black on one side, and they've got I think it, they call it debossed. I don't know what the fuck. And, and, and it's my, my last name is like massive, but it's this debossed thing and it doesn't fit on the card. So like only like two thirds of my name is on the card. And then when you flip it over, it's like this hot pink and the rest of my name is on that side. Uh, so they're incredibly, I think they're incredibly steezy. I think when you give somebody a, a, a black card that your name doesn't fit on, there it is. Beautiful. Look at that. Where is it? It's in oh, Colin's. Oh, it's in screen. Colin's camera. Colin's screen. Can you see that, JJ? I can't see Colin. I don't know where he went. What no. do you mean you can't see Colin? Have, have you been able to see him this whole time? I've been seeing him this whole time, and now I can't see him. No, oh, he's he's holding up a photo of the cards. Okay, I can see now. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Now just fo focus your pupil. <laughs> dilate. Dilate. I love it. I love it. That's yeah, great. and I'll tell you, when you hand somebody that, you handed them a business card. <laughs> the, 
They may not like it or they may love it. I don't know what, but they know they got a business card. Do you think business, so like on the topic of like resumes being potentially a dying artifact, you don't think the business card is a dying artifact? It is, but for, for different reasons, right? Yeah. What do you think, Colin? Uh, I think it is. I'm, I, haven't, I haven't given anyone a business card for a long time. Um, I, I think it's nice to have, but it seems so, like it's just sort of something you don't really use anymore. I like them. Just like I like physical books and I like real Me too. newspapers. Me too. And I like six, I like them, but no six one, speed no one, no one manual wants, transmission no Mustangs. <laughs> I like physical books too. I never have uh, yeah. Well I, I do you do you write in books in the margin and highlight and shit? Yes. I like like dog ear pages, I write in them, like and then I refer back to them. Like yeah. I have all my favorite books and like and I, I quotes I like, yeah, all that, right? Yeah, so, and even if I don't refer back to them, just the just doing the highlighting and the drawing and the whatever, it, it helps sink in the old duder's head yeah <laughs> <laughs> do you like, how often do you guys read and like what kind of do you read like business like you know just fun books like what do you guys read or only have you read anything recently like oh only only business books pretty much um i listen to most of them on audible um what was the let's say um what was my last uh I like Hooked by Near Aol. Okay. That's a really good one I like. Uh, addictive features and products is really cool. I just got this. <laughs> I can't read it though. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Chinese version of Play Bigger and, and, and I don't know why Pac-Man's on the front. No, it's, just, it's, it's, it's Play, play Pac-Man is what it's called. <laughs> You're but competition. That, that's, that is cool. You know, the day your, your Chinese book shows up, okay, that's, that's kind of cool. cool. But yeah. the one I've just read is this one. It's called Super Consumers. And it's written by uh, our dear friend, Eddie Yoon, who is um, uh, on Legends and Losers. And Eddie is a genius. And Eddie is the category designer, the category king of category designers. Uh, for the Fortune 500, particularly Fortune 500 consumer brands. And I met Eddie because he did some fucking awesome writing in the HBR. And he wrote one uh, article in particular, I highly, highly recommend. Uh, I think the headline is, um, why category creation is the ultimate growth strategy. And they do some data science analysis on the growth impact of uh, your stock if Wall Street views you as a company that can create and dominate new categories versus uh, growth from companies that aren't viewed as category leaders and, and creators. And it's fascinating research. Anyway, neither one of us can remember who reached out to who. So I'll just say I reached out to him, which is probably what happened. Um, and we just connected. And we sort of, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know, you know, when two. You have bromance. Yeah. Just say it. I was going to say when two animals of the same species meet in the wild, but yes, I had a total bromance. I, I'm, I'm man enough to admit I'm in love with Eddie Yoon. Yes, I, I will say it. And so we started sharing all this, you know, category nerd shit, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we've had a great partnership. You know, we've shared a lot of our thinking. He influenced some of the thinking for for the for our book play bigger and uh, we use some of his research in the book and he's an awesome guy and and uh, we have an episode coming up right colin oh yeah you do or yeah we do but you you have never met him in person still no i still haven't and actually i talked to him again the other day uh, we we're doing a little evil planning and yeah i mean we've now known each other for oh shit well probably three years and uh yeah never met <laughs> Doesn't really matter, right? No, I mean, in this world of like Zoom, look, I feel like I'm sitting here talking to you right now. Right. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I don't know why you need to go anywhere anymore with Zoom. <laughs> it's true. We have a, like, I sit on Zoom all day long. Cause I'm like, I'm a remote employee, which is so bizarre to me that I work for a tech company and I'm not at headquarters living in San Francisco. But it's an interesting challenge because you're, you know, especially when you're a leader that's so used to, leading by your physical presence, you know, Zoom really, I mean, 
it's, it's not the same as being in person, but let me tell you, it's a thousand times better than just being this voice on a phone, right? Like Oz somewhere. So, so much better. And uh, can, I, can I let a secret out of the bag here, Colin? Sure. Uh, we are going to have Eric, the CEO of Zoom on Legends and Losers real soon. Yay. Yeah. I yeah, uh, I was lucky enough to get connected uh, to him, and uh, we had a great email exchange. And we were actually talking some category design shit too. And uh, I said to him, "I said, hey, listen, we fucking love you guys, man. You have built an absolutely legendary product, and uh, you know, and they're backed by among among others our good friends at Sequoia." Um, and uh, have you had a chance, uh, JJ, to hear the uh, Blair Shane episode of Legends and Losers with? Um, yeah, I, I listened to I listened to the first part of it, and all honesty, to the whole thing. But I did listen to the first part. Of Isn't it. it great? Yes, huge. Fan. I love. Like I'll I'll tell you. Like, uh, and I I'm a fan of I'm an equal opportunity fan of many of the VC firms out there. But I have, and I didn't I didn't wind up in a Sequoia company. I love Excel. Um, it, like their their backer, the investor, and in, in Tenable. But I will say that every touch point I had with Sequoia throughout my process was awesome and like if i could have tenable was the right company for me but like if i could have wound up in a sequoia company like i would have been thrilled because i just think that they're such a stand-up firm and everyone i met with in that firm it's like it's what the valley is about it's helping people it's you know like paying it forward it like i just i love like this is a, like a totally unsolicited shameless plug for sequoia but i think they're one of the most stand-up firms in the valley well i i couldn't agree more um and blair if you have a chance to listen to the whole episode you know she's just so generous about her life and what it's like to be there and her thoughts on being a cmo i mean it's a great dialogue and uh she's an extraordinary person and um yeah, the culture there is amazing. And of course, Don Valentine, the founder of the firm, uh, you know, it, there's no debate, right? He's, he's one of the founders of Silicon Valley. He's one of the fathers of uh, venture capital in, in the technology industry. And, you know, you think about it, this is the guy that wrote the check to Steve and Steve Jobs and Wozniak, right? This is the guy that wrote Larry Ellison a check, right? Cisco, you know, all the way through to you know, uh, Airbnb and, and Zoom today. I mean, it's not like all the hits are, it's not like they just have old hits. They have a lot of new hits, <laughs> a lot of really big new hits. Okay. Uh, Palo Alto Networks, I think, is the biggest enterprise IPO in the last plus or minus decade, if I'm not mistaken. Real? Is that, real? Is that a fact? Oh, interesting. Uh, wait, wait, it might not be the size of the IPO. It might be the uh, post-IPO value creation. I think okay. that's what it is. If okay. I remember correctly, Palo Alto was the most post IPO value creation. Um, you know, and of course, uh, uh, WhatsApp was 22 billion to Facebook. Yep. You know, so, so yeah, but uh, to your point, you have Excel and you have Peng Lee. He's awesome. Now, the whole right? Excel I mean, you want to talk about a guy, you know, the interesting thing you talked about when you join a company, you, your relationship with the CEO and you want to make sure the CEO gets it. That's a fucking board member who gets it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I will tell you, like, Excel, you know, they're, on, they're at the same level and on that pedestal right there with Sequoia. Lo love them. Ping and the team, like, it, it was almost a serendipitous, like, Ping is, I mean, he's, he's a brilliant guy. He's a product guy, right? Like, super strategic, but he, like, he understands and embraces his category design. And it was fun because we just had our, our first board meeting and we were kind of talking through, like, you know, where we're at and initial thoughts and like, they got really excited. They, they, they just get it. Right. And it's so, you're right. To that point, it's so much easier when not only the CEO, but the whole board understands the process and the value of what you're doing. And um, they're smart. Holy shit. Yeah. You know, they're going to have to get paying a neck brace for his fucking brain. Cause his neck's getting, <laughs> can't hold that shit. Yeah. Smart guys. And I don't know. Do you have this experience, JJ? I got to ask you, uh, uh, and Colin too, for that matter, although Colin, you grew up here, so it'd be interesting to hear how it might be different for you. But, you know, for me growing up where I did and how I did, you know, for, for me to sit here and think like, we get to play in this world. Like, I, I go, what the fuck happened? Like, that I get to, you know, that we get to play in this world. We get to play with the best people 
uh, in the world, in our industry. I mean, there's the people we just talked about. There's nobody better than those people. I mean, there's other good people. There's, you know, it's a big industry. But like, do you ever think back at all? I guess, I guess that's what I'm asking. You ever think back to when you were, you know, even a few years ago, or even you know, when you were like, it, I, this never occurred to me that I could come here and, you know, work with the the elite of Silicon Valley. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I I moved out. I went to school here, right? And so. I graduated from college. I'm not, I'm fine to say my age, but I graduated from college in 96, right? Oh, so, smarty, smarty right, pants, just because you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, I, but the point is, is like, it was right when the dot-com boom was like coming on the scene, right? And like, I didn't have enough context and business maturity and whatever to know that this was like, you know, tech was going to become, right, the like, as important and as an foundational of an industry as it's become to the world, Right. And, you know, it seemed like it was this fun craze of like, oh, these people moved to San Francisco and everyone's creating these like pets.com and whatever, everything.com, right? And, um, and then everything crashed and you kind of thought, well, is it going to ever come back? Like, I don't think anyone, like now looking back over the last 20 years, like, like if I knew that, if I knew then what I know now, like, holy crap, right? I mean, like you know, being in the companies that we've been in with the leaders we've been in, um, my time at Andreessen Horowitz, like, I mean, there were times when I'd be in a room and like, you know, listening to Mark Andreessen talk, I'm like, holy shit, how many people would like die to be in here right now in this like, you know, like in this room with like 50 people in it. Listening so, to him. so what was it like? Take us, take us inside, take us on a tour of Andreessen Horowitz a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Where, where's where's the men's room yeah <laughs> actually there's there there are some if you do watch silicon valley on hbo it's funny because there's like I, actually, I, I, you know, I, I don't and i have a lot of friends who tell me to watch that and to watch the facebook movie and to watch the steve jobs movie and 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 i can't watch any of that shit jj i just it it to me it'd be like a heart surgeon going home and watching you know some tv doctor show or whatever or a cop going home and watching you know CSI 4000 or whatever, how many there are of them. You might have a good laugh at the Silicon Valley. No, I have to say, they've done a really Everybody, job. I just, I just, I, ah, I'm repelled. It's really, <laughs> it's very accurate and not in like a, it's funny, but it's, it's super accurate. And like, I know, I know, I know. But the reason I bring it up is because there's, there's been a couple of episodes with like shots of the Andreessen, outside the Andreessen Horowitz office, including the episode, I think the last week's episode or something was like the little walkway. It was kind of funny. Oh, uh, funny. Um, but you know, you and and like, so what's it like being the marketing leader of Andreessen Horowitz? Well, you know, I mean, like working in the firm, like you are, you know, very much, you feel like being on Sand Hill Road in a VC firm that you're kind of like the epicenter, uh, at, in, at the epicenter of Silicon Valley and innovation and working at a, a firm um, you know, with the cachet and the prestige of rightfully so of Andreessen Horowitz, like you kind of feel like you're in the epicenter of the epicenter. And like, it was just like what I, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't even in there like at the firm for that long. Cause I, I, um, you know, moved out to go into one of their investments, right. As CMO. But, um, but it, what I, what I viewed it as was, you know, cause I'm an operator, right. And that's the whole model is bring operators in and to help their portfolio companies, scale right and you know i viewed it as like i'm just gonna take this in like i'm almost like getting my second mba right like i'm just gonna like absorb all the information i can and um and i really like you know i wish i would have had more time in the firm quite frankly like i i left for you know good opportunity how, how long were you there jj i was there uh 11 months so i wasn't there that long oh right? wow fuck that was yeah. fast yeah it was, it was quick because I but, went and, and do you know I, I keep hearing the average tenure of a cmo is is about somewhere between 24 and 36 months. Yeah, I've heard 18 to 24. I mean, but like the, the case with Andreessen is that I, I went in to, to go be CMO at Tanium, right? Which was yeah, like you left top. for a portfolio company. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, which, which it, is that almost expected in some ways? No, you wouldn't. You know, I think like if I were to characterize like different groups in the firm, I mean, there are definitely like, I, I would say some people that worked in the firm that were more finance, investor, VC, right? Like they weren't necessarily operators, but they were more like in the VC community, right? Either doing like deal flow or analysis or that that kind of research, right? And so there were that definitely those that that group of of people. 
Um, and then there were former operators like, like me, right. That, you know, were, you know, either, and it, it were all, it was all across the board. Some people earlier in their career, some people, you know, later in their career with me, like, you know, later than me, like kind of, you know, on their, I don't want to say they're, they're downward spiral by any means. Right. But like they're, they're downward spiral from, they're not really an operator anymore. Right. <laughs> and it's not a downward Some of us spiral. have been on a downward spiral for it's years. It's not a downward spiral, believe me. But, you know, uh, and then there were kind of people like me were, you know, like still kind of in their prime of their career. And um, I'd say I was probably, um, I don't want to say I was in the minority in that, in that, but you would think it would be much, I guess you, you'd think it would be much more common for people to move from the, the firm into a portfolio company. I, I didn't see it. Uh, so I, is what you're saying, because there are, you know, more people in the firm who are former operators who are now doing this, they're less likely to go back. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, you couldn't yeah. get me to take an operating. I, I mean, there's yeah. no operating job in the world that you could possibly get me to take. So yeah, I, I, I get that. Yeah. Um, it was, it was and, great. And, and were they, you know, because in a lot of ways, uh, well, and not in a lot of ways, Ben and Mark are absolutely category designers. And they did it as operators multiple times, uh, of course, Netscape and, and, and uh, Opsware. Um, uh, and, and really, they're doing it again, I think, right? They're trying to uh, reimagine what a venture capital firm is. And they're, in so doing, they're trying to educate the market, that is to say entrepreneurs, that they are a new and I would argue different model of venture capital firm. Absolutely. I mean, and, I, and, and how much of, how much of your job there? Well, how much of the thinking there is, Hey, listen, we, we need to continue to condition the market to understand our differentiator and therefore really uh, change the criteria by which uh, venture capital firms are measured. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, their, their point of view was that when you lose the technical founder, which many times is the case, right? Technical founder goes in, the company scales beyond a point where they can lead it and they bring in the professional CEO, right? So their point of view was that when you lose the technical founder from the company, you, the vision goes out the door, right? Which I, I do believe that to be the case, right? And so their, their point of view was, let's build a firm that doesn't, you know, where like, you know, historically a lot of times each, each partner at a VC firm kind of has, they have their portfolio, they have their network. There's not a ton of cross-pollination across even the, the general partners to share knowledge or contacts or the network, et cetera. And there's not, there's no resources really to go help that, you know, like I've never started a company, but like watching how hard it is to start a company, like, you know, and a lot of times these founders have, are brilliant technical people that, that maybe are younger in age, younger in their career. Some of them haven't even worked in a company before. So like, how do you actually provide operational resources across every You don't function. need to work in a company to start one. I mean, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so like the, the model, the model was God was, bless America. Yeah. And you know, I mean it, it, that in and of itself was, you know, a new way of thinking about how to structure a VC and the service the VC provides to the portfolio company. I think the other thing they did um, really brilliantly, and I know, you know, Margaret, right. From, from outcast and she, you know, joined the firm to run marketing was like, they pe became a innovative thought leader. And I don't, it, it, PR machine is, is, by, is not the right word, but it's like, like they became a source for um, real like thought leadership around innovation. And like, the they, new have, they have a great podcast and they've, they've had it for quite a while, right? Yeah. I ama mean, amazing blog, amazing podcast. And, you know, like throughout media, right? Like, like what, she, what they, and then what Horowitz wrote, one of the, you tell me certainly 25 most important books of the last 15 or so years. I don't I mean, it's way up there, right? Business books, the hard thing about hard things. Yeah. I mean, it's always on like the everybody, top. everybody's read it in Silicon Valley and it's, it's transcended the Valley. That's right. That's right. And I think like, so that book was what, like, what was the kind of the, the, um, I, I love, I love that Horowitz quote. I, I can't remember it was it in the book or not, or maybe he, maybe he just said it. And he said that, um, oh yeah, when I was a startup CEO, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours shitting my pants, crying. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it was yeah. it's very close to that. Yeah, I mean the struggle is real, right? I mean I I can empathize with with anyone that's out there trying to start a company and how hard it is to get it to any level of scale. So, I mean, it was, 
it was great to look at the like look at technology and companies through a different lens both being from in the vc seat um you know and seeing companies from their earliest stage of of you know of starting a company right and the things they have to go through and you know all these like you know when you think about like like positioning and category design and like these are all things that that these companies, even at their earliest stage, need to be thinking about. Because a lot of the decisions you make and how you enter a market and how you talk about yourself and, and what you are, like you're gonna get positioned. And if you don't, to your like brilliant saying, position yourself or be positioned. And these are things that these companies need to be thinking about from the earliest stage. Um, and so I really enjoyed my time there. My, I mean, I, I did, I worked in the in the team that ran the executive briefing center. So was, I don't know if you know who Mark Cranny is, but it was Mark Cranny's team there, the market development. Yeah, team. I do. He was the he was the head of sales at Opsware, and of course, HP Software bought us and bought them, and so we ended up commingled. I, but I, I don't know him well, but uh, we certainly met, and uh, I know him by reputation. He's a he's he's a great guy. He is a force of nature, though. <laughs> yes, he, he he has a reputation for being a force of yeah. nature. Yes, um, but he built this amazing like just machine there around bringing in bringing in executives, um, CIOs, CMOs, and like matching them up with portfolio companies. I mean, half of um, half of Tanium's initial pipeline in that first like year or two out of the gate. Um, was from either sourced from the EBC or influenced by the EBC, right? In some way, you're getting higher up in the org. I mean, it, it's 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 not so just half a, the company's deals for the first couple of years came through uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Yep, either came through or, or helped accelerate them. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was a, a real. I mean, it made a real impact in getting the company. And these aren't like small companies, right? These are like Fortune 500, Fortune 100, like mega. You know like it would take years for a company on their own to like go and get like an introductions to the C-level executives at these major companies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, it's incredibly powerful and very differentiated what they've done. It's uh, uh, most people describe them as a disruptor in venture capital, which yeah. uh, certainly I guess you could say they are, but uh, I think they're trying to really carve out a new category, a new definition of what a venture capital firm should be. Um, right. But um, so as you think about the future, JJ, what are you excited about, you know, both uh, professionally and personally? And, you know, you think about what's on your mind? What, what do you got cooking? Yeah, well, I think, you know, professionally, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not leaving Tenable anytime soon. So I'm really excited to, to see where we can take this company and, you know, defining a category. And like, I think there's, I think there's um in the security market, right? I think it's so crowded, right? And um, you could say that it's really hard to create a category in security because it's so crowded, right? On the flip side, I would say that you've got two like segments of, of companies. You've got these like startup, right? There's a there's a ton of startups in the security space, right? All kind of addressing, you know, the you know, like specific problems or attack vectors or whatever, right? And they may not have the scale or the DNA or whatever to go and like, you know, pound their chest and build a category. On the other side of the spectrum, you have these big mega incumbent companies, which may not have the innovation DNA to go and build a category. So you have this, what I, I think there's this small finite group of these security companies that are like somewhere in the middle there, which have the scale have the customer base, have the brand recognition, have the platform to actually go out and shake things up and define a new category. And Tenable is definitely in that group. So I'm, you know, I, I feel very personally passionate about the security industry because it's obviously something that impacts us all deeply. Um, and, you know, I'm, I really believe that, that, that my mission and our mission is to really help, like help all of us as individuals because this is something that impacts us all. Um, you know, for, for me, there's two things. Um, the first one is, you know, I don't know the space the way you do, of course, but I've been in and around it a couple of times and, and d done some work. And here's what I found. And this is, this is going to be unfair, but I'm going to say it anyway. CEOs in the security technology space are generally nutless wonders. There's no, where, where's the fucking vision for this category? 
right? The big yeah. incumbents, you know, you look at Symantec, what a bag full of doorknobs that place is, right? To yeah. quote uh, J uh, uh, Rob Burgess, you know, and so you got the, it's, it's, it's weird. You got big guys in the space, n no agenda, no vision, no category design. They're just milking the cow, right? And then on the startup scene, I, I don't know. Here's what I, I have this weird theory. And my theory is because the security space by definition is about defending against bad guys, the headset of a lot of the folks that run these places is sort of very defensive and conservative. And then along comes a company like Palo Alto Networks and goes, bam, and executes a category design strategy, you know, almost flawlessly and builds one of the most valuable enterprise technology companies in a long time because they had the balls to truly reimagine something to, 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 to reframe an entire market, to evangelize it with a powerful point of view and to move the whole market from where it was to where they wanted it to be and slay everybody in between. And they, they should get a shit ton of credit for that. And I thought after Palo Alto, okay, you know, maybe there'll be more either CEOs of incumbents or startup CEOs who grow a pair and actually try to do something innovative, do something legendary here. And, and, and again, I'm sure there's companies doing things that I'm not aware of. So I apologize for that, but I don't know. I had a, let me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a victim here. Maybe I'm just having all my flashbacks. You know, I have not had a good experience with chief executives in the security technology space. Let me put it to you that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I would say to that, um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of headstrong personalities in this in this space. That's probably the nicest way I can say it. Um, but I I think there's I think there's an epidemic right about I, I think this is bigger than security, but I definitely see it in security is I think there's this epidemic about being really lazy around and that's not like not being smart. There's a lot of good technology out there, but like you go to a show like RSA and the big security show in San Francisco and it's like a fucking joke. Like I, we didn't even exhibit there at Tanium because I'm like, like why? I mean, you're like, you look like the like, sea of like hundreds of booths and maybe a thousand, I don't know. And everyone sounds exactly the same. Like plagiarism in like using the same words, copying each other's messaging. It's gotten to a point where it's like- They all sound like the parents in a Peanuts cartoon. That's right. And like, I think, you know, marketing didn't create all this, like the, the you know, all these startups and like the fact that the space is crowded, but marketing has a, like, they need to be part of the solution because all this, like everyone sounding the same and noise is like not helping anyone. Like, like it's, it's like you put yourself in the, in the but, shoes. Of but that, that's what I mean. The security space is one of the most important spaces. Some people might even argue it's the most important space. And I wouldn't, you know, argue against that. And I know there's a lot of companies uh, doing some, in, you know, incredibly innovative things. So I know what I'm saying probably sounds terrible. I, I don't mean it to sound as broad brush as it probably does. But in my experience, and I've had it multiple times with multiple companies and multiple leaders, um, just not a lot of courage or their conviction to do something legendary and really try to um, create a new category around powerful new technology. Just know there's no, nobody wants the agenda. And then, and then, Palo Alto shows up and crushes everybody because you know what? They got the triangle right. Product, yeah. company, and category. They evangelize the shit out of the category and ba-boom. But I guess what I'm saying is I'd love to see a lot more of that. I'd love to see some exciting, uh, engaging, interesting things. And, and here's, the, here's the second thing. Here's the security product I want. You ready? I'm going to give you my product idea. I'm just going to give it to you. Yeah, come on. Somebody come on. attacks my device or server or network. You grab them and you pull them forward. So imagine like in a fight, somebody goes to, you know, with the jab or the cross, I don't care which, they throw a punch at you, right? You slip the punch, you grab that punch and you pull them forward because their momentum's already forward. And then you put them in the hospital. <laughs> I want technology that does that. I want you to grab the punch, grab them, and beat the shit out of them. I want, I want security software that goes on the offense. 
That's right. That's right. You hack us, we hack you the fuck back. (laughs) 10X. We're going to fuck you up. That could be. Yeah. I want the fuck you up software. When can I have that? Could you put you in the hospital? Fuck you up. Put you in the hospital. Yes. We'll work on that. And if you make me kill you, I might, but I'm definitely, definitely going to the hospital. Because you're a nefarious bastard. I want, I want them to pay a price. The problem is there's no price. See, if somebody comes up to me in the street and tries to rob me, they got to deal with me. Yeah. Right? The thing I hate about hackers is they're pussies. They don't have to deal with anybody. They're sitting in, the ro- in a room somewhere, in a basement somewhere, wondering what women look like naked <laughs> in person. <laughs> What, what, maybe we could put all the hackers on a reality TV show and it would be like Survivor meets like, like what if you had like a hacker, like Big Brother and Survivor, but all the hackers together in a house. What and do you the think? Winner, the winner gets to meet a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and like, maybe like a little the bit. Win, of- the winner gets to have coffee with Jennifer Johnson. He gets to go on a real <laughs> date with a real woman. No, not even a date. Just, just, they, just coffee with jj and they'll be they'll be blown away (laughs) imagine if you hadn't really seen a woman in your adult life and then you met jj (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna stop myself right there (laughs) yeah so i'm excited to answer your point though i'm super excited about the future um at tenable i think uh in designing my own life my category of my life um i would I have this vision in my life of being um, like bi-coastal, like living in San Francisco, but maybe living in New York. Um, you know, my, my company is an East Coast based company. So I've always kind of had this dream of like kind of having a foot in both camps. So that's my personal category design goal is to figure out how to make that happen. So are you interested in my feedback about that? Yes. It's awesome oh, no. if you can do that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe you go for, tell me to fuck myself. That's fine. But uh, I never bought a place in New York, although sort of, I couldn't say come, came close, but started to think and work about work on it. Didn't obviously do it. But um, yeah, there was a point in my life, you know, where, where ultimately at Science, we were dually headquartered. Uh, although most of the senior execs were, were in San Francisco, but we had a, a handful in New York and, and the business sort of, you know, was, I don't know if it was evenly spread, but you know, there was a lot of business in New York. And so, you know, I was there for a week, every three to four weeks for, for a lot of that run. And, and, and so that, uh, that experience of, uh, living in the tube, you know, uh, a JFK to SFO and back again and back again and back again, um, it's, it's, it's very cool for a while. That's how it was for me. It, it got to be less cool after a while, but uh, it was very, very cool for a while. And I don't want to sound ungrateful. Uh, you know, um, doing that shit is fucking cool. <laughs> so yeah. you should do that if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, even if it's not, you know, even if it's a, a temporary thing, right. Yeah. Get it out of my system. But uh, that's my kind of my next personal mission but work's keeping me pretty busy so <laughs> we'll see. yeah how many hours a week are you working oh always it's, yeah you know how it is it's, all, it's there's no it's, all. it's just on yeah but i love it i mean i live for this shit so i mean i wouldn't have it any other way fighters gotta fight that's right that's right i'm Painter a gotta paint <laughs> <laughs> all right is there anything else before we kick out of this one jj no i mean this has been i've been so first of all i feel like it was a rite of passage being even invited huh. to come on the show so why do you say that you. why do you say no, that? i mean like you guys are legends and everyone that's been on the show is is a legend i think you've had a really interesting um mix of different people from kind of different backgrounds which i love so keep that up and i'm just thrilled that were you, you know, did you expect that or did you not expect that or no i did i did i'm just happy to see it right because i think i mean you know you, you you've even gone like outside of tech right like you had a, someone from like ufc and like it's really great i think like a couple of weeks ago you had like someone who's been a real impact in in your life like from a you know like a life coach perspective right so i mean it's really cool to see that it's not just silicon even though i mean you know, obviously there's a heavy Silicon Valley and tech bend to this, of course, but it's, it's actually really interesting to hear from people outside of tech too, 
So definitely keep that up. But I'm just honored that I'm part of the I'm part of the legends, uh, you know, the legends and losers family. So thank well, you. Well, I, I love you, JJ. You. You're you're awesome. You know, and 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 I just love to be around you and people like you. You know, when I met you, you were more towards the beginning of your career and you were a, an emerging rock star and you just kept taking ground, massive, massive amounts of ground. And, you know, I know uh, one of the, well, I guess what I love about our industry, and I'm not sure it's the same in others uh, or in some others, is we don't judge you on who you were 10 years ago or 12, 15 years, you know, whatever it was. Right. And so, because we all were there 15 years ago, right. We all start off as developers or sales reps or product managers or campaign managers, or we all, you know, in martial arts, they say everybody starts as a white belt. Right. And so I guess what I'm trying to say to you is it has been a joy for me to see you where you were as kind of a, I don't know, would it be fair to say kind of a, you were a mid-level marketing person? Yeah. yeah. On, where did you come in on? Were you on the campaign side or the product side? I don't remember. I started on the campaign side and then I moved over to product marketing. Yeah, okay. And so to see you go from a, you know, pretty bright and shiny uh, young campaign manager uh, to literally being the most uh, recruited uh, enterprise CMO in Silicon Valley, I fucking love you for that. That's awesome. You took me on that ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and likewise, right? Because I think, you know, I guarantee you, if you looked at how many people that were part of your marketing organization that went on to become CMOs, I would bet money on the fact that there are more CMOs that came out of your Mercury organization than any other tech company in the last wow. years. And I, I would bet money on that. Wow. I, I, I don't know how we could figure that out, but that's very cool of you to say. And uh, I just feel fucking lucky as shit. I mean, we had murderers row. We had murderers row. I mean, and, and to your point, look at where everybody is. I mean, Sue Barsamian runs, I don't know, some gigantic uh, percentage of uh, Hewlett Packard by way of example. And not only CMOs, we have all kinds of CEOs. Yes, yes, Ramin, Michelle, like Michelle Feaster. I mean, there's tons of them, of course. Of you all, is uh, uh, from yeah. what I hear, is doing great. You know, and on. I mean, Sunny Gupta's company. I mean, there's there's tons of them, right? Um, but uh, yeah, you 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 you've taken me on your ride because I get to see you every once in a while. Well, thank you for being a mentor and a friend, and both you and Colin. Um, you know, you you continually teach me, and you know. I aspire to be a better person because of people like you in all honesty. And, um, you know, thank you guys for doing what you do and continuing. And, you know, I think that you're continuing to, to kind of impart your wisdom and do what you do best on your podcast. And like, it's just a continuation of your amazing book and your career. And I, I love it. I love it. There needs to be more people like you guys in this, like all of us in this world. So thank Aww. you. Oh, I know. Thank, thank you, JJ. No, <laughs> you're an absolute sweetheart, and and you're an inspiration. Thank you guys so much. Be All legendary, right. my friend. All right. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye. Whew. Wow. Amazing. I, I just I can't believe we get to do this. Um, uh, thank you, JJ. Of course, thank you, Colin. And uh, thank all of you for listening. You know, you guys have allowed us to create. Um, a platform that means uh, I get to have those kinds of conversations. Colin gets to have those kinds of conversations with amazing people like JJ. Um, also, I got to ask you, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the t-shirt I'm wearing. It says legends never die from a company called homage. Uh, it's a great t-shirt. Feels great, soft, comfortable. And somebody sent it to me. I just don't know who the fuck that was. And I've, Try to ask people who I thought might have done it and nobody really any seems to know. So if you're the person who sent me this great Legends Never Die t-shirt, uh, let me know so I can thank you. <laughs> All right. If you love this episode, you'll love episode 05 uh, with tech industry icon and journalist Bob Evans. 
As you know, I'm going to be on tour with our good friends at NetSuite number one in cloud ERP. Current dates are August 24th in San Diego, September 20th uh, in Denver, September 26th in Toronto, September 27th in the beautiful New York, New York, and November 9th in smoking hot Miami. And so come on out. Uh, I'll be doing a talk. Uh, there'll be other industry leaders um, talking about how they use technology, new business strategies, uh, the legendary uh, NetSuite executive and good friend of mine, Jason Maynard, will be there. And I'll be doing a book signing. And hopefully in New York, we'll get a special appearance by Kevin Maney if we can swing it. Uh, if you'd like a personal invitation to any of the tour dates, email blackhole at legendsandlosers.com and uh, you can check out more information at legendsandlosers.com. Click on the NetSuite tour uh, menu item. You can check us out at legendsandlosers.com. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube and give us a legendary review. We sure do appreciate it. You can find us on facebook.com slash group slash legendsandlosers, Twitter at legendsandlosers, and again, the email is blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And I want to thank you so much for sharing the show, telling people about the show, uh, and and, uh, shouting out to us and all that stuff. You're driving uh, tremendous growth for Legends and Losers, and um, it's really fantastic. And, And you're you are making true what um, Sabrina Horn, Legends and Losers guest said, uh, was that Legends and Losers is the, quote, podcast that Silicon Valley needs. So that becomes true and truer every day. Also like to shout out to my friend, Pete Chargan. Pete, you're an awesome guy, good long-term friend, and your ongoing uh, support of Legends and Losers and Play Bigger, uh, our book is outstanding. So thank you again, my friend. Bob O'Brien. You continue to be a a huge supporter of ours on social media. Um, And uh, I I really want you to know how much I appreciate um, your amazing support. And I also want to thank uh, Daniel Hall for having me on his awesome podcast, Real Fast Results. We would like to thank Equity Directory, the invite-only network of entrepreneurs and startup talent exchanging work for equity. HarperCollins Instant Classic, Play Bigger. How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Our good friends at OneLifeFullyLived.org, the nonprofit helping you to dream, plan, and live your best life. Our friends at Spiro, the sales app for salespeople and sales managers who want to make money. Positive Marketing, PR, Marketing, and Category Design in London, Europe, and beyond. NetSuite, number one in cloud ERP at NetSuite.com. Tenable Network Security. Technology is a dangerous sport. Protect yourself at Tenable.com. Island Angel Care. Professional nannies certified in CPR and first aid caring for your little angels on Maui at IslandAngelCare.com. Category Design Advisors. Working with leadership teams to dominate new categories. OutPosition.com. Legendary marketing and category design in beautiful Singapore. Hal Elrod's amazing bestseller, The Miracle Morning. PursuingResults.com, producers of legendary podcasts, including this one. Interview Valet, podcast interview marketing. Get yourself on some podcasts and get some business done. Uh, 1185 Design, building brands in the heart of Silicon Valley. Super Consumers, the awesome new book from our friend and very soon guest, Eddie Yoon. The Comedy Nest voted number one, the number one comedy club in Montreal, Canada. Laugh your poutine off. (laughs) Or as we say it in Canada, poutine. TheMarketingJournal.org. That's what legendary marketing people read. It's an excellent publication, and uh, I think you should check it out. TheMarketingJournal.org. And Doctors Without Borders. You make a donation, and we make a difference in the most difficult places on planet Earth. Today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. This Oddcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we hope you continue to share the shit out of it. All rights are disturbed. This is not recommended for wankers. We need to warn you that this Oddcast is highly flammable. We recommend being nice to your mother. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Listen to Tom Waits. Hands up. Chin down. Support your local category designer. Teach girls math and science, watch Spinal Tap, and remember to surf naked. And uh, hey, Colin, don't forget, 
this odd cast really ties the room together. Our deepest apologies go to Greg Clark, CEO of Symantec. Sorry, Greg, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. Be legendary, my friends. We'll see you soon.